question, feel free to put something in the chat box or raise your hand and uh, our panelists and presenter will be glad to answer your questions. I'm going to turn it over to Bevan Gibson. Good morning. I'd like to welcome our panelists, Dan Deasy from the College of DuPage, Joy Crispin from Elgin Community College, Elizabeth, Elizabeth McNulty from Elgin Community College. Welcome. And now we'd like to start all of the questions. So, Dan, what actually would you give as definition of a support course for an IET model? Uh, well, for us, it's, a, it's an opportunity for students um, in the ICAPS program or IETT program to uh, work on uh, some of the, the um, areas of content covered on the academic and the academic um, coursework that they're doing within the ICAPS. So for us, um, we have primarily CIT programs, CTNA certification programs, and CONTIA. So they have an opportunity to work on what they're learning in class with an adult ed faculty and a CIT uh, lab aid. So they, they receive a lot more hands-on work in a, um, a CONTIA lab or a networking lab. They cover the information that was, uh, or reinforce the information that was covered in their academic program. They also work on um, reinforcing some of the, the uh, concepts and, and um, content that is covered in the adult education. So we have primarily um, high school equivalency courses that are contextualized to the uh, CIT program. So they do work on things that they've covered in that course as well. Um, and they reinforce ideas and concepts in that support course time. Okay, thank you. Joy, do you have anything to add? Um, the only thing I would say is for us, um, it's just a course taken in addition to their content classes. So the students would attend their tech classes and then we have an additional class which would be the support class um, that we meet with them twice a week again what Dan said just to reinforce what they have um, discussed in their other classes and it is non-credit and it's free for them. Okay, Elizabeth do you have anything to add? Um, no. Unmute. Uh, I'm sorry I forgot to unmute here. Um, yeah, uh, not really. I think Joey said it all, you know, as far as that uh, first question. Um, you know, as she said, ours is non-credit and free. And, and in our program, I, I believe Dan said um, they have someone from the tech side as, as a lab aide with them. Um, in our support classes, it's basically just the adult ed teacher working with the students. Okay, and, and, and what do you, Elizabeth, while I have you on here, what, is, what do you think the purpose of your support course would be if you were to tell someone what the purpose of that is? Um, basically, it's to ensure that students are successful in the career tech programs. Um, the students, uh, you know, in our program uh, tend to be not college ready and, you know, they may uh, have been put in a developmental ed class so uh, our support class allows them to get into a certificate program uh, faster it accelerates their path toward a career um, so you know that's I, I think our basic purpose to help them to be successful and and I think um, to help them to know that they can be successful because so many students uh, that we get have very don't have much confidence in their ability to succeed in college and so I have found that the support class gives them a real boost um, it lets them know that yes I can succeed in a college class um, and we see that by the fact that um, at least in the dental program that I work with when students are done with the ICAPS uh, class they continue on their own to get more certifications and, and I think um, a part of what ICAPS did was was give them, you know, the confidence to, to let them know that they could do that. Okay, Dan, do you have something to add to that, like the purpose of your support course? Uh, it's very very similar. Um, you know, in, in addition to the reinforcing the content, we also cover some of the same things that were mentioned, more about academic skills and um, those skills you'll need to successfully transition at, at the college level. So we, we talk about you know, establishing SMART goals, executive function skills, time management techniques, studying strategies, listening strategies um, as far as lecture is concerned. And then we do, um, we schedule 
other support service units at the college to come in and do presentations during this time too. So they'll they'll have we'll have career services come in and talk about job search. So we, we do we kind of mix in quite a few things external of just the content reinforcement of the academic side and some of the adult ed side. So it's kind of a you know as the as the sequence of courses progresses or the track progresses, you know the, the content will change a bit as we get closer to the end where they're they're ready for the certification and either a transition to further you know the further stackable credential within the CTE side uh, or you know direct employment. So we start working on some of those those other things uh, as a, a bit more frequency as we get closer to the end of the of the track. Okay. And Joy, do you have anything to add? Um, no, nothing in addition to that. Okay, then I'll start with you. Well, what is included in, in, in your support course? Okay, a number of these things were already stated, um, but I'll just go ahead from our perspective. Um, we do include, in, in addition to the reinforcement of um, content, we do work on study skills, time management, organization skills, basically anything that would help them be more successful in their tech classes. Um, we give them extra time to work on their assignments so when they come to our class there we reinforce the vocabulary, um, the reading, we give them more time to work on their computer assignments or math, whatever it may be um, that they need and then um, we give them maybe some extra work to um, give them extra practice. Um, we help them studying for quizzes and tests, writing their papers, um, their finals, anything that they need to help them be successful. Um, I have been the CNC specific support instructor for the last three years and so for us there is a, a fair amount of um, reading in their text so I'll go over the vocabulary with them, um, help them understand the concepts, um, help them study for those quizzes again. They do have a big writing assignment, so we'll help with the editing of that, help them come up with their ideas. Um, the whole writing process we support in that. And then, of course, for CNC, there's a lot of math instruction as well related to the technical field. So um, we'll do a lot of practice and making sure they understand um, even foundational math before they even get to some of the math concepts in the regular classes. I'll preempt some of that and make sure they understand that before they go to their tech classes um, and then they progress on through their math and then a lot of them have really struggled with math in the past so I have done a lot of support for the math instruction as well. Okay, hey, thank you. Uh, Liz, do you have anything to add to that? Um, I think Joy has uh, said it quite well. I'll, I'll just add my experience from dental assisting. Um, we, uh, you know, we really don't have to get into math. It's it's just not part of the program. So one of our, uh, our a big focus is vocabulary study. There's a tremendous amount of vocabulary to learn in the dental program. And uh, so, so we do, you know, a lot with things like word parts, roots, suffixes, uh, prefixes. Um, the the instruction in our dental program uh, relies a lot on on PowerPoints and information from their PowerPoints. So, in, in addition to looking at, you know, how we'd approach their textbook, um, we we work with, you know, note taking and. Um, you know, transferring that information from the PowerPoints into notes that they can study from. Um, so, you know, and, and other than that, it's uh, very much as, as Joy said. Um, we, you know, we, we get into the soft skills, but um, when it comes down to it, uh, we really need to focus on the content because there's so much information and that's what the students want and, and need. So when you said PowerPoint, that you use the PowerPoint, it, would that be the, the instructor's PowerPoint that you're using in that support course? It, it is. Um, the, the, um, the instructors in the dental classes tend to put all the information they want the students to know in their PowerPoint presentation. Um, and students will typically, typically print these out and use them to take notes uh, during class. So, you know, one of the things we do is talk about, okay, you've got this PowerPoint, this picture of this PowerPoint, and you have 
you made little notes all over, now let's organize that material, you know, into notes of your own, um, which, um, you know, we do just as a way of reviewing the material, but also, have, you know, for them to have something organized to study from for tests that, you know, in the dental program, they're tested almost weekly. It, it moves very quickly, it moves very quickly. Very good. I think that's an important skill, that note-taking skill and, and actually organizing their notes um, for them in class. So, um, Dan, do you have anything to add to that about what's included? I know you added a lot of things um, on the previous question, but is there anything else you'd like to add? Yeah, I don't really have uh, anything additional. Okay. Joy, do you have anything? Okay. Let's go on to the next question then. Um, let's talk about planning for instruction. How do you plan for instruction in your support course? And Dan, let's just start with you. I know you're not an instructor, but how does your instructor, um, how, how does that work for your IET program? How do they actually plan for instruction? So one of the, one of the things that uh, we did in a design before we started, we, and I, I think many people do this, we had our, our chosen adult ed faculty um, do audits of all the courses, um, ongoing audits. Uh, so they could they could look at content on the academic side as well as you know pacing of the course those types of things um, and then when they were when they actually got to begin to partner with the CTE academic faculty um, each for each cohort in each class they develop a flexible work plan um, they review the syllabus of the content course uh, and that instructor is asked for guidance as far as you know um, just you know obviously pacing can change as the the content's being delivered. But to try to get a kind of a frame uh, to build the support course on, and then I think flexibility is the key there because as the course progresses and as content's being delivered, um, then that flexible work plan will change based on the needs of the students and what's actually occurring within the class. So, uh, Joy, as far as, um, what are your thoughts on that? How do you plan for instruction in your support course? Um, very much like what Dan said, we do audit the classes with them. Um, we really encourage our first year um, support instructors to attend all of the classes. Um, after we've done it for a year or a couple years, we still attend about half time um, just so that we can be current with what is going on in the classroom. Um, we also build really good relationships with um, the core instructors um, so that we've got open communication, we discuss often how the students are doing, um, what areas they feel certain students may be struggling um, so that we can reinforce um, the gaps that they need in their understanding. Um, and obviously we talk with them a lot about upcoming quizzes and tests, different assignments. Um, our teachers are pretty organized at the beginning of the semester so we have a, a good idea of what's coming up when, but um, really close communication with our tech instructors. Um, and then um, Sometimes I do look ahead to see what's coming up and like I said previously, um, especially in the area of math, um, there are a number of concepts that the students need to really understand before they get into the level of math that they are expected to know in these classes. So I'll do you know, instruction on fractions and decimals um, before they even get to um, their tech math classes. So um, that's, that's about all I have for that, I think. Okay. Liz, do you have anything to add? Um, the only thing I, I probably want to add is that in, in our program, um, when, a, when a, a support class is first developed, you know, the, the very first teacher to teach in a, a support class for a particular program um, is asked to develop a binder, sort of a curriculum for the program, and, and this will have you know, maybe sample lesson plans and, uh, you know, practice exercises, vocabulary work. Uh, it might include, you know, practice quizzes and things like that. And so, who's ever teaching next would have this material available to, to them. And, you know, of course, the material is constantly evolving. Um, you know, in some cases, I know in dental we had a new teacher, so things needed to be tweaked or changed. But there are these resources to to draw upon. And then um, Dan mentioned the word flexible. <laughs> Flexibility is very important. Um, 
you know, uh, I think that's why it's so important for the support teacher to be in the, the technical class because you're observing your students and, you know, where they're having issues, you know, what they seem to be confused about. Um, and, you know, that that really determines what happens in the support class. Okay, thank you. Joy, um, let's, let's move on to the next slide then. Um, what about students? Do you, do you provide any instruction for students other than adult education students in your support course? Currently, we do not. Um, we are opening it up this coming year to others, um, so we'll see how that changes um, the dynamics of the support class, but currently we don't. Um, and as far as reporting goes, we're still working out how that reporting piece will occur once we do have other students in our classes. We have a, a question from Lynn Burkett. Um, she says, can, can you ask them, uh, ask you guys, how you structure the pay for auditing and planning time? You know how to, Dan, would you like to address that? Uh, our HR um, department has a predetermined range based on activity, so we use uh, kind of a non-teaching assignment for them as far as uh, related to course development and planning. So there's a, there's a pay structure associated with that based on our adjunct agreement, so we just use that um, to pay faculty or okay. determine where to pay. Okay. Um, Elizabeth or Joy, do either of you know that answer to that question? I know you're both instructors. Um, yes. As far as the auditing the classes, um, we get half pay, half our regular hour per hour course um, pay as we're auditing. Um, so, yeah, I th I'm not sure. I th it's just half time half pay for the auditing the course and then for our support course we get the full full pay for that. I hope that helps. Yes. Okay. All right, then let's go on ahead and, and and Dan, do you provide instruction for students other than adult education students in your support course? And if so, we do not, no. how, if so, how do you count them in your reporting? Currently we do not, so we don't we don't have the issue of uh, reporting on non adult end right at the moment. Um, let's move on and say about the instruction. Let's talk about the instruction. Um, what instruction, you guys have already kind of covered what instruction is provided, but who who is the person that provides the instruction? Is it the adult education instructor? Is it is it kind of a mixture? Do you ever bring in, I know you, someone said that you bring in some of the, uh, the college support people to come in and, and talk into the classroom and speak in the classroom. But is there anyone else who provides instruction other than the adult education instructor in the classroom? Uh, Liz? Um, it, as far as generally the support class, it is just the adult ed teacher. However, we have a separate, um, it used to be a separate class. It's going to be done as seminars now, but uh, thriving in the workplace. And um, those are taught by uh, adult education, an adult education instructor also and and that covers um, you know team uh, working as a team kind of employability skills you know working as a team and and they do get into um, you know uh, job interviewing and uh, and that self management and that type of thing but that's that's outside of the support class time okay Dan is is anything different for you I've primarily taught by our adult ed, and I, as you mentioned, we bring in external uh, support uh, staff from support units of the college. And then for the hands-on um, CIT work, there we do uh, have a lab aid when they're in when they're with the equipment, so they help them um, with that. Okay, um, I just wanted to let you all know that we do have some questions, and we're going to uh, bring those all up toward the end of the the webinar, and we will address your questions. So. Let's go ahead and, um, Joy, let's start with you. What time have you found to be a good time to provide the support course? 
depending on the career tech area, we have found that it's best to have the class either right before or right after their tech classes. Um, this is because of attendance. Um, if we were to have it at, on a separate day or a separate time, um, our attendance would probably be lower. Um, also, as the CNC instructor, I like to have mine right after their core classes so that all the material is fresh in their minds and I can review it, give them extended time to work on their assignments or get on the computer working on their designs. Um, so I prefer it right after. However, our welding instructor likes to have it before class. Um, so she meets early in the morning um, before they have to go into um, the shop to weld because their instructors like the students to be there right on time and she has found that a number of hers tend to come late so she likes to have the, the support class before that to get them all ready and prepare them for the lab and make sure that they're on they're there on time. The only other thing I would add is we like to meet at least twice a week instead of just one longer time um, it just spreads out the support and the help for the students, and we find that it's more effective that way. Okay, and you said for a longer time. So you meet twice a week. So so totally, how many hours long is your support course? Um, ours are generally an hour and 15 minutes each class, so two and a half hours a week. Okay. And Dan, um, what have you found to be a good time to provide your support courses, and, and also how many hours a week is, is it held? Uh, very similar. We, we like to schedule them either uh, immediately after or prior to the, the content course. Um, and we typically do one hour, so twice a week, so two hours a week. Okay. Liz, I don't think you probably have anything to add because that's all at Elgin. So I'm going to go ahead and start with you, Liz. Okay. Um, how, how do you, let's go ahead and the next question. How do you measure the outcomes for your support course? Um, well, for, for all of our adult ed classes, um, we, um, we assess students according to outcomes in listening, speaking, reading, and writing, um, and, you know, in, in some cases, math. So we do look at those outcomes. And then, of course, we look, uh, as an instructor, I, I think we really look at their success in the, in the tech class because that's, you know, that's our goal, to help them be successful there. And also we look at uh, whether they continue into college to get more certification or whether they get a job in uh, the field they're studying. Okay, I think it's probably important to uh, note at this time that you, you have an ES, you're an ESL support course, right? Um, actually, it's all adult ed. So while my class has always uh, always had a mix of ESL and adult ed students. Okay. Dan, um, how do you guys measure your outcomes for your support course? It's primarily the success in the content courses. So because the majority of what's being covered is the reinforcement of what's being delivered in that in those courses. So it's um, how well they're doing within the, the labs uh, during the content time, grades, how they do on their exams, assessments. And then as we get closer to the end, it's more of, uh, you know, how well is the ICATS program doing all together? Are they getting their high school equivalency? Are they passing the industry um, certification tests? Are they, get, are they becoming employed? So um, combination of all those things. So are you, are you actually um, having students take their high school equivalency then um, as part of that support course? Is any of that information covered in that support course? Uh, they do work on some things. Uh, they, they, they are, in addition to the support course, they are attending an adult ed uh, high school equivalency course, courses throughout. Um, so, and those are contextualized to the content as well. So the primary, primary focus of the support course is um, covering what what is being covered in the content courses, the academic content courses. Okay, Liz, do you have anything to add? Uh, no, um, I, I will just say some of our you know adult ed students are working on their GED also, and they're you know taking classes outside of the support class to accomplish that. Um, our I can speak for the dental program. One of the requirements to enter the program is that. Uh, they have the GED. However, uh, in the past, they've uh, waived that requirement as long as the students are working on their GED and get the GED before they, they finish the ICAPS program. Okay, great. 
So Liz, I'm going to start with you. Do you have any tips for success in a support course for our, our participants? Um, well, a, a couple, and uh, one is that uh, the support class teacher needs to attend 100% of the tech classes their first year doing this. I, I think that's really very important. Um, and to do the work along with the students. Um, you know, taking the test, you know, making sure you understand the material. I think it's important, you know, for the support teacher to really understand the material that's being taught and also to, I think, to help build trust with the tech teachers, you, you know, so they feel that if you're reviewing material, you know what you're doing. Um, and then that goes along with tip number two, which is, you know, the importance of developing a relationship with the uh, tech instructors. Um, you know, and, and going to them, you know, feeling comfortable going to them with questions or clarifications, um, that, that's very important. Um, I also think having consistency in teaching teams is important. Um, you know, when, when someone signs on to, you know, be the, the CNC support class instructor or the, the dental instructor, a support class instructor, I, I think it's important that um, they're hoping or willing to make a commitment to continue for several years be because I think, um, you know, you, you get to know the program, you get to know the instructors that you're working with in the tech program, and um, it just makes it so much easier if you can build a relationship and sustain it over time. Um, and uh, as we've mentioned before, um, teachers need to be flexible. Flexibility is the key to this, I think. Okay, great. Joy, do you have anything to add? Any tips for success? Um, I don't really. Liz really covered everything that I was going to say, um, but I would really reinforce the flexibility piece. Um, you, we really have to be willing to um, go with the flow. And you know, it, each semester, each year is different with the students and what their needs are, where their gaps are. So really being aware of the student needs um, and how to really support them. And I guess the, the one other thing I just thought of is a lot of these students come in with a lot of outside stressors. And so being aware of those things um, that really affect their ability to learn and um, study and so to be able to provide support services or, or guide them to support services that may be in the, at the college, um, whether it's tutoring or, or other needs that they may have um, at home even or, or child care, um, but just to help guide them to places that they can really get the support so that when they're at school in their classes, they can really be successful. Okay. Dan, do you have any tips for success? I think everything that's been covered has been on point. I mean, um, again, I think I think what's really important outside of the communication uh, and and flexibility, you know, that that role of a, the role of the faculty member that is working with the cohort, that consistency and and their understanding that they are they are many things. They're not just the instructor, right? They do have the flexibility about. It was incredibly important that was just mentioned about understanding the students and their needs and the challenges they have external to the course and trying to address them in, in any any manner possible within you know within our resources um, but they wear so many hats and they have to do it well and it's a balance um, you know I, I found it's interesting selecting the right faculty and having one, one longevity is extremely important but we've had experiences where you know there has to be that right right balance of understanding and empathy but also discipline and you know we've had mm. some faculty that did not have the right mix and um, I think while they were being supportive and encouraging they left that piece out where accountability came in so it's, it's really when we found that if we if one, once you get that right mix for an instructor hang out of that instructor for dear life because they're extremely critical to obviously to the process and, and having that balance and blend is, is leads to the success of the students so Okay, thank you. Joy, um, do you have any, any cautions that you would offer for a support course? 
Anyway. Um, yes, I. one thing that we talk a lot about here, we have a phrase, leave your ego at the door. Um, and I think that's really important as we go into the classrooms of these core teachers. Um, it's not to be critical of, of their teaching style or, or what they do in their classes. We are there to learn. We are there to support our students. We are there to help in any manner possible. Um, and like I said, just not be critical of their their teaching. Um, and so, like we've said, you know, really build the relationship with them, not tear it down. So I think that would be the biggest caution that we have here is is really leave your ego at the door. Okay, Liz, would you have anything to add? Um, I, I I don't think so. I think Joy said it very well. Um, and uh, just again, as Dan said, you know, find. Uh, it's so important to find teachers who can make the commitment and, and who will stick with it. Um, and other than that, no, I think it's been said. Dan, any cautions from you? Uh, no, I, don't, I have nothing to add to that. Okay. Um, let's go ahead and see if you guys um, have any resources that you use that, that you think would be beneficial to share with our group. Um, Dan. Uh, I think the, many of the resources are driven by those that are used in the, the academic course or the content course. So I think based on the content, those are um, you know those are mainly guided by that that faculty and that um, that support unit. So I don't have anything specific to share uh, on CIT on the CIT side. Okay, Joy, any specific resources or things that you use in your classroom that, that you think might be of use to our listeners? Um, not really. Like Dan said, a lot of our resources just come um, from the core teacher. There, there are some math websites that I'll use um, to work on you know, problems, um, but that's about it. Sometimes I'll use Quizlet to help with vocabulary practice and development, but that's about it. Um, okay. Uh, Liz, anything to add? Um, no, I, I just, uh, we do have uh, available to teachers uh, a big binder of materials uh, that was created by, you know, the first teacher that taught the class, and I think every teacher maybe adds to that or uh, tweaks things a little bit according, you know, to what's happening um, with the current C, uh, CTE teacher, and um, so you know that will have a lot of uh, uh, supplementary materials, you know, maybe practice tests or vocabulary and uh, the exercises that the teacher can draw on. Okay, um, I know that that I can share with the group that we do have on the ICAPS website um, team, under Team Teaching tab. Um, there are multiple resources that are available for team teachers um, and, and are at the ready for anyone who would like to use those as well. At this time, I'd like to uh, possibly go back and start answering, uh, asking some of these questions and see where we are. We started with um, Lynn asking about uh, paying time for auditing and planning time, and I think we answered that question. Um, she said she also wanted to know, do you get any planning time? Um, Joy? We don't have any planning time scheduled into our day. That's done on our own um, at home. However, we do have office hours that we have contracted. So I think it's 25 minutes for every hour. Um, so, you know, we'll use that for planning time or making copies or getting ready and then being available to students as well. Hey, Dan, do, do your... Um support course teachers get planning time? Uh, they get planning time at the front end of the cohort when they're when we're starting a new cohort and they're either establishing a relationship with the CTE faculty or planning out the um, you know that kind of developing that flexible work plan. But throughout um, when it's being delivered throughout the cohort, no, they don't they don't get additional planning time. Um, and here is another question from Arlene. What are tips that would help in the recruitment of these students into an IET? Um, Dan, I'll, I'll start with you. Uh, recruitment is very, I think everyone will find this true, it's very difficult. Um, so 
our most successful um, path to, be, to, to getting students into the program is to work with existing um, HFC students or those that are coming in and inquiring about it and we have them fill out a, uh, a uh, kind of a survey of, of uh, career survey, career inventory type of thing. So that will drive further discussion if, they're, if they check off uh, or if they select a career in, in the areas that we are offering in ICAPS. Um, so more at intake and those that are coming in already with an interest to get their high school equivalency. Um, we do work, we have a, a person at the work, our, our one stop, who um, you know, continually meets with the counselors there um, and distributes information about it and accepts students walking in um, with that interest for adult ed. So, and then we also do the more traditional and I think less less effective uh, advertising through uh, radio, print, those types of things. But, but primarily our students are coming from those that are seeking out uh, HSE coursework or higher functioning uh, ELA students. Okay, thank you. Liz, do you have anything to add to that um, about recruiting your students for your IEC? Um, well, currently we, we have a full-time person who um, is in charge of recruiting now. Um, and uh, they've just hired two full-time retention specialists and what they've been doing this semester is uh, going around to all our adult ed classrooms, you know, ESL and adult ed, and talking them, to them about the ICAPS programs, you know, uh, what, what it can offer them. And so we're recruiting um, in that respect. Um, I do believe I believe our ICAPS now is under Title III. To, to be honest with you as an instructor, I don't know a whole lot about, about that. Um, but um, I, I think some of our, because uh, the program is now open to all students, not just adult ed students. So that's, I think, changing things a little bit. I believe in, in our uh, HVAC program, they've gone to an opt-out idea where students are automatically in ICAPS unless they opt out. I don't know if they'll be doing that in other programs or not. I'm not quite sure. Okay. And Joy, you had said that, that you're, you had office hours and, and so Lynn would also like to know, are your office hours paid at the half rate also? Um, no, it's not additional pay. It's just part of our contract. The, our support courses are a three-hour course, and so um, we get paid for that, and then we are expected to do 25 minutes per hour. Um, so we can schedule that wherever and however we want to. But you're not paid for those? Not additionally. It's okay. just part of that pay for the course. Okay. Um, I have an, one more question. Um, says, how do, how do you get enough hours for a valid post-test? I guess, um, I don't know, I think that was in reference to the students attending X number of hours. So I, I think that, that the confusion may be that, that part of it is that they're HSC course uh, at the same time that they're taking the support course. So Dan, would you like to address that? Because I think that's where you would get your number of hours, correct? Yeah, they're enrolled in adult, in adult ed. Uh, in one of our core courses. So for HSC, they'll be enrolled in our, our HSC course in addition to the support course. So their hours are being generated in that adult ed course primarily for uh, to meet the post-testing minimums. Okay. Um, I think that possibly answers Ginger's question then, um, hopefully. Well, we would like to um, thank our, our panelists. Thank our pan any, there are no more additional questions. We'd like to thank our, all of our panelists. Thank you, Dan Deasy. Thank you, Joy Crispin. And thank you, Liz McNulty. Um, we thank, thank all of you for participating in this webinar and for all of your questions. We hope you found it beneficial. And we look forward to seeing you. Our next webinar will be April the 20th. And that is on expanding capacity for ICAPS programs to address pressing needs of employers. And we'll be having a guest from DCEO, Mike Baker as well as some of our adult education representatives on that panel. So um, thank you all for attending, and we will see you later. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.